Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Conversations on Conversations, where each week we explore a topic or topics to help us have more powerful conversations with ourselves and each other. I'm your host, Sarah Noel Wilson, and joining me again for her her second episode. <laughs> it's going to be good, Chris. It's Dr. Chris Wildermuth, my my dear friend, mentor, and colleague. So for those of you who may remember, she was uh, one of our first guests when we talked about humanizing workplaces. And, and that will certainly be a, a theme in our conversation today as we explore uh, the topic related to ethics and leadership, and we see where that conversation goes. But for those of you who it's the first time meeting Chris, let me tell you a little bit about her. She's a passionate professor, researcher, leadership development consultant, has engaged audiences and students for over 20 years. Originally from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, Dr. Wildermuth immigrated to the United States in 1992 and has traveled extensively facilitating leadership and diversity inclusion programs in Latin America and Europe. Her main areas of research include leadership development, education, ethics, and international intercultural relations. She has written a book on diversity training published by the Association of Talent Development and published in peer-reviewed publications such as Journal of Business Ethics, the Journal of Leadership Education, the Journal of Psychological Issues, and Organizational Cultures. She holds a Master in Technology Education Training and Development and a Doctorate in Leadership Studies from Bowling Green State University with a dissertation on employee engagement and personality. She is the chair of LinkedIn's 1 million plus group for HR professionals and is a member of the International Leadership Association Leadership Academy facilitation team. That's a little bit of a mouthful. But here's what you really should know about my friend and colleague, Dr. Wildermuth. She lives in West Melbourne, Florida with her husband, Mel, and furry family members, Frisky, Bambi, and Buffy. She loves discovering new beaches, making impromptu trips to the Disney parks in Orlando, and learning painting from Bob Ross. Welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you. And of course, we have not included the favorite thing about me for you, Sarah, which is my love for weird technologies. Let's see which one I bring up today. <laughs> yeah. So one of Chris's favorite things is just technology, novel technological solutions. So every time that we meet, you will ask the question, oh, do you use, and then it's some goofy <laughs> word. So today in our meeting, it was Scribble and Scrivener, uh, which I actually knew one of those, so I felt pretty good about that. But if you are somebody who is interested in a uh, novel, unique, up and coming technological solutions to your training, learning, research needs, she has an ongoing inventory of, <laughs> of the boobly the what <laughs> but it's I love it I love it I just can't keep up with it also folks y you can hear it in our voice Chris and I have known each other a very very long time we are family we are sisters and in full transparency y'all I'm here because of her she was my mentor and uh, professor at Drake when I was getting my master's and she is the one who said you should think about speaking so if you like what I do, you have her to thank. If you don't like what I do, you have her to blame. <laughs> I always smile when you say that. It's so cool. <laughs> so, okay, Chris, you know, we we haven't talked on the show with you since we literally started. And there has been a lot that has changed in your life. There has been a, you've moved, I think, since last time we had you on the show, or maybe you had just moved. But you are in the throes of some pretty massive research for a book you're working on. And I would love to hear all about it. Okay. So yes, so about a year ago, and it was after our conversation, because I remember where that conversation took place. Uh, I moved to West Melbourne, Florida, um, to direct the Bachelor of Science in Organizational Leadership at Barry University. So Barry University is actually in Miami, but I live in West Melbourne, near the beach, and most importantly, near Disney. Um, <laughs> because when given the choice between near Disney and far from Disney, I'm like, I'm going to go all the way to Florida, and I'm so far from <laughs> Disney. No, that can't be. So I live about an hour, actually, I know exactly, I live an hour and nine minutes away <laughs> from Disney Springs and an hour and 20 minutes away from, I think, Animal Kingdom is the farthest one. 
<laughs> which is really, really fun. And uh, one thing I've been working for the last year, and uh, one day I'm going to finish and buy not a bottle, but probably a case of champagne, is a, a book on, it's uh, tentatively titled Against All Odds, Leadership in the Handmade Sale. Mm -hmm. So I've been connecting various topics uh, related to shared leadership, um, alternating leadership and followership, um, complexity leadership. Like if, if you can think of non-traditional leadership and um, the characters and situations of the Handmaid Tale. So that's what, that's what I've been doing. I love it. So, you know, and, 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 and I had shared with Chris beforehand, I have not read or seen The Handmaiden's Tale, so I can't engage in conversation around that. However, I can engage and would be curious to engage and explore some of these topics, uh, things like shared leadership or alternating or even followership, um, because you and I have lots of conversations informally about the challenges of leadership in organizations, how often, uh, you, you know, just today we were talking about the impact of coercion in, in the, or, you know, in organizations. And so are, are you comfortable for us to just talk about first, just starting with this idea of shared leadership and this concept and what does that I mean for people with, who aren't familiar with it? Yeah, and I am, but with with the sincere caveat that I'm not an expert in shared leadership. So a lot of the topics that I'm exploring now um, have to do with my trying to make sense of leadership within uh, the show. And just to give you a, a very brief synopsis, um, it's The Handmaid's Tale takes place in a fictional dystopian world in which um, People are oppressed and uh, imagine like a uh, fundamentalist, religious, uh, pretty toxic group. Um, I told a friend of mine yesterday that it's kind of like the Nazis married uh, fundamentalist, religious people who married the Taliban. I don't know. I don't know how mm. to explain that. So it, it's it's a very, very, very oppressive world. And it's in particular, it's a very oppressive world for women. But what's, what's interesting about The Handmaid's Tale, and that's what kind of inspired me, is that you can't really say that there is a leader mm. in that story. There mm. is a protagonist. There is somebody on whom the light is shining. There yeah. is somebody who appears in many of the scenes, but that doesn't necessarily mean that she is the leader or at least not the leader all the time. Hmm. Um, there are multiple other leaders. So then that got me interested in, okay, so what is that? Is, is that shared leadership? Mm. Is that, is that followership? Is that like, what is that? How, how do I find out what that means in terms of the literature? And that's when, I got into share or distributed leadership, and then I got into various models of followership. And then yesterday I was reading about leadership moments and the relationship between the leadership and follower and how it alternates. So that's kind of like my world right now. Actually, today I got into complexity leadership and theory. So it's it's been kind of fun because by now I've gotten away from the first chapters that I wrote are naturally the ones that I knew more about. Sure. The ones about ethics and leadership. Um, I've written the chapter about role theory and leadership. So those I've already written. And now I'm embarking into this, you know, journey with yet another software called Research Rabbit. <laughs> oh, that's a third one. All right, Research Rabbit. What is it? How do we use it? This is now going to turn into an episode of just what are all the tools we should be using? <laughs> so what Research Rabbit does is you go in there. And by the way, this tool is absolutely free. It's totally free. So you go in there and you look for keywords of whatever research you're doing. And I have like different libraries for each of the chapters. And um, for example, I could be looking for distributed le leadership or shared leadership, right? And it's going to start populating with articles. 
Now, it doesn't have the PDFs of the articles for uh, copyright reasons, sure, but, the, sure. but then I can go to the library, to the university library, and find the articles that I want, right? Once I discover which articles are I want, and I don't need too many, five, six, you know, at most 10, now that crazy thing starts populating it with similar articles, later ah. articles, earlier articles. And not only that, but it creates this graphic in which you can see like the little bubbles, the little circles, ah. and the bubbles are bigger when they are more cited articles. And then you can see like the articles that are the hubs that a lot of people read. So I sure. very quickly can see, oh man, if I'm talking about complexity leadership theory, I really need to read these five like cited by everybody things. Now, are there other tools for that? Yes. But either my university doesn't subscribe to them or they're crazy difficult to learn and research sure. rabbit isn't. I love that. So, I, so thanks for that tip. I'm, I'm totally going to download that. Not tonight because I have a lot of work to do, but this weekend and play around with it. Okay. So, okay. so let's, just, let's take us back to this idea of shared leadership. And I understand that you're not an expert. However, it is probably safe to say that uh, you are more familiar with it than you're certainly more familiar with it than me and probably others. And some people might not even be familiar with that phrase or that uh, title even. So so let's start with what, what does shared leadership mean? What does it look like? Why, why and when is it important? Okay. So the let's take a step back and talk about what leadership means, like have yeah. a shared definition of what leadership means. Um, different definitions by different authors, but maybe a simplified definition is that leadership means influencing others. But when people follow a leader or the followers, by definition, um, do so voluntarily. We were talking, you and I were talking mm -hmm. about coercion before. If there is any sort of coercion, and by the way, by coercion, I don't necessarily mean you're putting somebody against the wall and, you know, threatening them with their lives. If somebody could lose their job, if they, if, if whatever they're doing could damage their reputation or their career or their opportunity for a promotion or even their chance for, I don't know, some free time or resources, that's coercion. So yeah. basically, when you have leadership, it's because people are following you regardless of authority and voluntarily and freely. It's kind of like the question you could ask yourself is if you're really talking about a leader, you would follow that person even if that person were not your boss, did not have any authority over you, was not hierarchically superior to you in any way, and yet you would follow that person. Folks, if you, <laughs> if you hear us, if this conversation feels a little disjointed, my friends listening to it, it's because we've run into some audio challenges and then it makes <laughs> us giggle and then we come back to it. But I, I do want to come back to your definition and that combination of definitions that leadership isn't just influencing others, that there also has to be followership, which as you described is freely, voluntarily, regardless of authority, following someone. And I want to take a moment because you and I talk a lot about, and people have heard me say on the show, leadership isn't a role. It's an, it's an act, right? It's a, it's a verb. And, and just to pause a little bit on that coercion again, because I think that that is a phrase, like you said, that people will think looks much more aggressive than it can. We know a lot of companies who are coming back to the office and expecting people to come back to the office. And if you don't come back to the office, you could lose your job. And that could be could be perceived as an act of coercion, right? Um, it not it only is an act of coercion. It, it, is it is an, an act, act of, of coercion. coercion. So the, well, the, the question that you ask yourself for coercion is, would you do it voluntarily? Like, for yeah. example, today, now, um, you, you invited me for this, um, for this podcast, which is always a lot of fun. And I did it voluntarily. There is absolutely no 
consequence to me of being here or not being here. You invited me voluntarily. There's no, there is absolutely no coercion in our relationship, uh, pretty much ever, but especially in this moment that we're using as an example. So the question is, when you, when you're trying to ask yourself, is there coercion? The, the, what you need to ask yourself is, would this person do this voluntarily? Would this person do this regardless of the consequences? Are there any consequences that would be dangerous for that person of not doing this? If the answer is yes, you're, you're not talking about leadership. You're talking about um, authority. Yeah. And leadership and authority do not mean the same thing. Right. And followership does not. And that was a distinction. And now I'm trying to remember from whom. Um, Lucier, I think, is the author of the book. He's the author of a well-known textbook um, uh, published by Cengage. And now I apologize, but I can't remember the no, second okay. if you, author. If you think of it, then we can add it into the show notes, right? Just yeah. to give them credit. It's it's a well known textbook for for leadership, and he um, was differentiating not only leadership and leading, but also followership and following. Huh. Um, you could follow someone. You could follow somebody. Following <laughs> would be somebody told me to do something, and I'm doing it. Yeah, but followership is a voluntary submission yeah. to somebody else's leadership. And there's a lot of power in that word. What's also interesting about leadership and followership, first of all, um, there is a lot of agreement in the literature that you cannot, and that makes a lot of sense, you cannot have leadership without followership, just like you cannot have a teacher without a student or a student, with, right? Like there are some roles in society that, that are interconnected. Hmm. So. Uh, I think I read it in a book by Maxwell a long time ago that uh, thou, who is it? Thou who leadeth and hath no followers is just taking a walk. So if, yeah. you, have, <laughs> if you have a leader uh, and doesn't have a follower, then that's not a leader, right? And, and likewise, a follower will, um, will include a leader. What I've been seeing in the literature is the idea that leadership is a state, just like when we talk about engagement, you talk about this, the state of engagement and the mm -hmm. trait engagement, where it, the trait of engagement is traits that lead somebody to probably be engaged more likely than others. And the state of engagement is, are you engaged in that moment? Well, the state of leadership is, are you leading in that moment? And mm -hmm. that state does not need to be permanent. In fact, leadership and followership can alternate. The leader can become the follower of the same leader and the follower can, like, they can take turns. One of the problems that we have when we look at the literature, though, is that a lot of the literature on leadership is focused on leadership within organizations where it's very hard for you to differentiate leadership from authority because authority yeah. is part of the is part of the picture right hierarchy is part of the picture so it's very hard for people to imagine so what is of course there is authority in this picture right but when you have a a, a situation of crisis in which random people are ra are, are rising in resistance you don't necessarily have a leader. It would be too dangerous to have a leader. Sure. So then what you have is, is, is people um, working towards the same purpose. Um, another interesting thing that I read uh, yesterday is that in a way, both the leadership and the, both the leader and the follower are followers of the same purpose. Hmm. They are both followers of the same goal, and, and mm. that's what binds them together. Mm. Which is, I feel like often is a disconnect when we think about that from a workplace perspective, that there's not always that joint sense of purpose, again, because somebody might be following because of authority or yes. coercion. Exactly. Um, instead of, and now sometimes, you know, I think about my career and times when I was following and was very clear we were on 
a shared mission together, right? We are in a really focused purpose. But I think, yeah, I think that is interesting. In organizations, we use the language of leadership so directly tied to positional power and authority Mm -hmm. that I think that creates barriers to people being intentional about creating acts of leadership because they feel like it is a role instead of a state, as you've shared, right? That it, that I wonder, I'm, I'm just chewing on right now the relationship of the overuse of the word leadership to role authority and the impact that that has on actual leadership in an organization. Does that make sense? Yes. And the thought that is coming through my head is that there has been kind of a vilification, I guess, if that word exists. Does that word exist? Of, vilification. Of man- sure of the word management. So nobody wants to be a manager. A manager is seen as kind of a lower level. Besides, you even see that in the leadership, the leadership development literature, right? Is that manager, you have the supervisor, and then you have the management, and then you have the leaders. And usually that that's equivalent to the people higher up. But all those are based on authority. And yeah. that also colors the research because a lot of the research is done where? Where, where that is taking place. So then now how, how do you separate? It's like when I did the, my, my work on engagement, I, my favorite question was, would you continue doing what you're doing if you won the lottery? Mm. Uh, and of course, that, that's kind of a simplified question because you the answer might be no, but for reasons that have nothing to do with your passion for what you do. Maybe a family member needs you or something else. But in general, if you think of what is it that you would continue doing regardless of how much money you made, because money is a sort of coercion in a way, Yeah. yeah. right? Um, the question is the same for leaders. Hey, leaders, if you really want to be a leader, ask yourself, what would be people doing if they didn't have to? Mm. If you were stripped tomorrow of your authority, what is who is it that would continue with you? Mm. And what is it that they would be doing? Mm. And anything that has to do with your position, your formal power, and I'm using formal power or positional power, because of course there are different types of power. Yeah. Um, Whatever it is that people would be doing because of your positional power, your ability to reward, your ability to punish, that's not leadership. Yeah. Um, So going back to your original question, so then what's shared leadership? So shared leadership would be when, for example, you have a team that has a common goal and they're literally sharing leadership. Um, it's not even that they are alternating it, then which one person is a leader now, has a state of leadership now, and the other has a state of leadership later, is that they're literally making those decisions together or that Mm. different people take charge uh, of certain aspects of the project or certain aspects of what they're doing. Um, It's... um, what some of the the literature will state is that the concept of a top-down, authority-based, coercion-based um, method of influencing others, I'm, I'm trying to look for a word that is neither leadership nor management, does not work as well in an in information industry, does not work as well with a highly complex highly volatile world in which change is constant and there are wicked problems that we can't seem to solve. Yeah. So, uh, and one thing that occurs to me right now as I'm talking about that is when you talk about an organization, say company, little company X, a startup who has a very charismatic founder and everybody's doing what the founder said, um, you, you can imagine that authority working, right? Mm-hmm. But let's think about things such as climate change. It's a wicked problem. Um, would climate change, is it conceivable to think of a leader to solve climate change? Uh, so because we can't think of a leader, the only way to solve that problem is by having, uh, the word that comes to my mind is popcorn, <laughs> is, is, is having like 
emergence of local leaders who are going to be in the state of leadership in different times, in different places, in different moments. And that's the only way that we can possibly address this challenge. Different inventors, different visionaries, yeah. different idea makers, different people influencing their little areas. Do you feel like that's possible in the current corporate landscape to have shared leadership? That's a tough question. Or what or what would need to change? And certainly we've seen organizations who have tried to remain flat. And and I often see them at odds with still wanting to maintain the traditional sense of authority on some level, right? And that becomes that that tension point. Or I think about you know, back in the early aughts, when you had holacracy coming to the forefront, the the whole movement of leadership circles, essentially, right? Zappos was really that shoe company was really big at the time exploring that, but it, it doesn't feel like a lot of those took hold. And, you know, because let's, I mean, let's also be real when we talk about what leadership looks like, and what we've researched, it also is what leadership looks like from a largely predominant white male perspective as well, right? Because that's who's been in power for ever. Yeah. And 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 Western and and also uh if we're going to talk about positionality, let, let me express like what is mine. Like I'm a woman, I'm a Latina, I grew up in a very uh patriarchal world, grew up in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, only came to the U.S. as an adult, and it's not like the U.S. is not patriarchal also. Um, so I have my own biases, and I also have, uh, if you look at the research uh, on gender and leadership, you will see that that women tend to be more communal and, and uh, they can, in general, statistically speaking, obviously. Yeah. So am I impacted by that and fascinated by the idea of community decision making and so on? Yes. And are corporations like that, at least in the US, no. And in other countries where the power distance is even stronger than in the US, uh, probably not. Um. So I don't know necessarily that, first of all, uh, power based on, on authority is not necessarily a dirty word. Sure, sure. That's fair. Right? You, you yeah. can exercise that power ethically. Yeah. We're talking about ethics. You, you yeah. can be ethical about it. You, you need to be my, my old professor at Bowling Green State University, Dr. Patrick Pock, and a shout out to him. He used to ask us all the time, what will you do with the power you were given? Yeah. So if somebody is given the power of authority, the power to reward, the power to punish, the power to take somebody's job away, they need to really be conscious of what, um, what that power means. Um, are there situations in which authority will be the fastest way to get something mm -hmm. done? Yeah, I'm living a situation yeah. like that right now. I'm changing the curriculum of my program and like making all sorts of changes. Is it easier for me to just say, all right, guys, here's what we're going to do. Boom. And, and, and get it done. Of course. Um, I think the question is, if you are in a situation in which if we think about adaptive leadership, if you are in a situation in which there is no expert, in which you mm. really don't, nobody really has a magical telescope, nobody has the a magical map that tells you where to go, then to have somebody who is just acting on, the, on authority and everybody's just following that person because that person has authority can be very dangerous. Yeah. It's interesting because uh, a situation's coming up for me as I think about my own life and reflecting, have I ever experienced shared leadership? 
I think as a company, we're trying to move more towards that. And I'm very aware as the business owner, I have an incredible amount of authority, right? And how do I use that in a way that will benefit more people than not? When I reflect on my career before starting my company, I think there's only one situation where I experienced probably what was close to shared leadership. And that was when I was at my last company, Arog, but it was in a specific project, right? It wasn't the whole scope, uh, but it was when we were doing all this culture work because none of us had ever done it in this way. So it was this sort of triangle, <laughs> mm -hmm. if you will, of myself, my boss, Lisa and Aaron. And it was this constant sort of stepping in, taking, you know, right? Like it was just, it was a an, an, an organic way of people stepping up and leading different parts of it because of the complexity of it. It wasn't, it wasn't an easy fix. It wasn't, uh, oh, just do this and then we'll create the culture. And it, and what I will say for me personally, anyway, that was without question the most meaningful work I'd ever done to that point before starting my own company that felt like fulfilling, right? And so mm -hmm. I'm just reflecting on that, that relationship between shared leadership and engagement. And I think um, you said a couple of words there that are uh, that I'm thinking of. One one of them is commitment. So mm -hmm. that works well when everybody is highly committed to yeah. the purpose, and that purpose is cl crystal clear. I see um, in my career a lot. So many times I've been engaged in mission writing processes and vision writing processes, usually followed by two years of strategic planning. <laughs> But instead of really discussing what values are guiding that group and what really, what really get those people excited when they wake up in the morning, we mess up with where the commas are and how yeah. exactly the wording is going to be. If the group really has a sense of shared purpose, um, then shared leadership can work, but you do need to have that commitment. You do need to have that shared purpose. The other thing that you said is complexity. Um, it is, when it is a very complex project, you, you need shared leadership. You know what's, what's occurring to me? You know, when we met and you were doing improv theater and I went to see you in, in the improv theater in Des Moines. Um, yeah. It was so much fun. Um, can you imagine an improv show uh, guided by a theater director? Like, It's the worst improv is where somebody's trying to drive the scene. I mean, it happens, not in mm -hmm. a formal way, but it. some of the worst improv I've ever seen is because somebody wants to direct the scene, basically, instead of letting the scene emerge to whatever and the best improvers are the ones that go well I'll throw this out there we'll see where it goes and we'll evolve and expand and grow right it's the whole yes and idea so that's the quintessential example of of a yeah. shared <laughs> a shared mm -hmm. process like imagine that you and I were engaged in I don't know doing something that really difficult and maybe you have expertise in this one area and you are more familiar with this thing and I'm more familiar with that thing and then we alternate Neither of us has authority over the other, but we have a very strong sense of commitment to our purpose. That's yeah. what shared leadership would be. I remember when um, when I was still at Drake, I did an exercise. Um, I don't know if you remember an exercise called Marooned, in which people had to decide if you were marooned. It's an exercise by HRDQ. Uh, it's a... Uh, an online a company that sells like uh, training materials and so on. Is that like you're on an island? You're on an island and you have to decide yeah. to escape from the island. What is it that you do first, yeah. right? And one of the, and one thing that, and we did it to explore personality and we were talking about people who were lower in agreeableness and like super challenging and so on. The challengers worked great when they were right. <laughs> that when they were wrong, they led the whole group astray. I've even sure. done some exercises in which some some simulations in which I would give one person who was a challenger, I would give them the wrong answer. And then I would cheerfully see them lead the whole group astray. So the tragedy of authority based leadership is or authority based whatever the heck we're going to call that. 
uh, I can't think, I will call it management, is that authority-based whatever, is that if you are an expert and you know where you're going and you have the right map, if you're right, it is the most efficient mm. way to go from mm. point A to point B. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the tragedy is if you're wrong, it's going to be nobody's job to tell you you're wrong. Right. Well, and and the other, you know, what what's also coming up for me as you talk about that is the formal authority and also the um, informal authority, right? I we, in, in preparation for the webinar we did last month on remote relationships, I was very familiar. I'm familiar with a lot of different types of bias, right? But there was one that I came across that I, as soon as I read it, I, I thought, man, yeah, no, I've seen that. Is the the bias of visibility bias that we tend to prefer and defer to people who speak up first and who speak often, and. Mm -hmm. And right, which also gets into, I mean, we know this from a personality perspective, right? There's the perception that extroverts, uh, people who lean more uh, towards extroversion are, are better leaders or people who uh, lean towards more challenging make better leaders. And, you know, and again, it, it, this idea of shared leadership is so beautiful to me because it's about tapping into everyone's gifts that they bring to the table when they need to be brought to the table a bit. Like that's the the image that's coming to mind is um, creating the space for other moments of leadership to emerge that might not look like quote unquote, right? The traditional leadership we think of in, in American Western culture of what it means to be a leader. So that's the other thing that's coming up for me is and again, to that point of if the person who speaks up fastest has the expertise great. That's not yes. always the case. And I say that in full disclosure, as somebody who is very comfortable in many situations, speaking up quickly, right, processing verbally, that just because I speak first, doesn't mean that I'm speaking the best. But mm -hmm. there's an advantage that I have compared to say my colleague, Teresa, who is a thinker. I mean, we're both thinkers, but she's a she's a she processes in a different speed than I do. Mm -hmm. Right. And um, yeah, and I'm just I'm, I'm imagining and, and I'm also thinking about just right, we know that teams that are able to tap into their diversity of all intersectionalities, if they're able to lean into that, will be more effective. It's not just bringing together a diverse group of people and saying, go and I'm and, and I'm just kind of thinking out loud. Again, where are those moments of shared leadership? And how many people might really struggle with that idea because they like the authority. And I, I understand that. Yeah, okay, for I, sure. I, I, I get been, it. It's easier. I've been there. Like there's, especially when you're pretty convinced you're right. Yeah. It can be super frustrating. Like imagine a situation of crisis. You know the organization is in bad shape for whatever reason, right? There is a crisis in the air. And you have a lot of experience and a lot of expertise, and you're pretty darn sure you're right. Then a democratic process in which different people are going to take the lead can be incredibly frustrating. Yeah. Because darn, just follow me, right? Just, just follow me and I'll show you what the right thing to do is. Um, the real issue is, are you really right? And mm. do you really know where you're going? Mm -hmm. um, and if you do, awesome. Then there there could be a zillion situations in which you do. I think in today's organizations, uh, with all the changes taking place, like think of COVID, for example, that we've all lived in. All of a sudden, you disperse all those people. Yeah. And everybody is working independently and trying to relearn how to work. How that happened from one day to another. How does the organization recoup from that? How does it continue operating? How does, does it handle the crisis? At that point, there wasn't anybody who knew what to do, mm -hmm. but he did. It was a completely new territory. What's going to happen tomorrow? What will happen when we have our next crisis? And it's not if, but when. 
Sure. Yeah. And how are we preparing people to operate without a strict, a strong authority? And perhaps organizations should be spending more time um, focusing on purpose and values mm. and getting people excited about what they do and who they do it for and why they do it. Because if we really had that, then you don't need authority. Yeah. How, what does that look like? And again, I'm just, I'm speaking from my own personal experience. I spent uh, 15 years in insurance. So I'll talk to my first eight years. Insurance doesn't move my soul. I'm just going to say it. I, I'm happy to support those organizations for me personally that never gave me a sense of purpose, right? The thing that motivated me truly were my peers. Like, you know, I developed such close relationships that it was like, we're in this together. Now that changed when I went to ARAG because the type of insurance actually felt like it was beneficial to humanity because it was legal insurance and we were helping people in moments of crises. H how do we create that sense of purpose and meaningfulness, perhaps when people are doing jobs that for all intents and purposes are, are jobs, are industries where they go, it's good money, it's a good paycheck. Like, what is that? What's your perspective on what does that look like? And, I'm, and to be clear, I know there's a lot of people who get excited about a whole host of things. I know I'm not sp speaking for the masses here. I'm just saying for me personally, Right. An industry like insurance never, never fed my soul. It was it was what are we doing as a company to take care of our people? That's what was motivating to me. So how do you how do you navigate purpose and values, perhaps in a situation like that? Ah, oh, yikes. <laughs> in, the, in an ideal world, your people are going to have like they are going to have that sense of what they're doing that for. Yeah. Because you can think about insurance in a way that changes lives and protects people yeah. in moments yeah. of crisis. If you think about insurance and you think about it ethically and not the right. stereotype that, that comes into many of our heads when we think about insurance, heavens, it's important. Yeah. And does it change lives? And does yeah. it protect people? And, and is it there when people need it? And so, that's not usually the story companies are telling. Usually the stories companies are telling are, how much money did we make? And what's our profit that's margins? that's the problem, right? Right, yeah. Because I don't think you're going to get people excited about the purpose of making money for the shareholders and making sure the CEO makes more millions. I, I, I don't know about you, but that does not... Like, it's not that necessarily through my career, and granted, I don't work in insurance, I work in academia, and there is nobody making millions. But, uh, like, I don't care how much the president of my university is making or not making. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't matter to me. But it's not what inspires me. I don't yeah, wake up yeah. in the morning thinking, yay, I made... I worked more and now the president I, can make more I money. I increase shareholder value by 2%. Now, some people are motivated by that, right? I mean, I talk to some people and they're like, I just want to win and I want to win for everyone. And the way that, and that's great, right? I mean, and that's, I think that's part two of, of, uh, being an effective leader is, is really understanding and tapping into, you know, you always use the language when we talk, like what, what lights up your eyes? Right. Mm -hmm. And how do you pay attention to that? And, you know, and I think about I had a leader, Eric Wishman. Uh, and I remember him once saying, <laughs> he said, I learned real quickly with you not to come to you with a project about how it's going to increase our bottom line, but how <laughs> it was going to impact people. Because if, if I came to you, Sarah, with like, yeah, we're going to save 20 some percent, I would just get a glazed over face. But if I came to you and said, hey, this is going to make people more effective, more successful. Like I knew I could get you on board because he knew he knew it inspired me. And again, that's going to be different. And I think that's part of the challenge too, right? Of creating a, a culture that motivates. I, I look at I look at my own colleagues, right? Um, Mary on our team is very she likes she likes winning. She likes closing the deals. Like that's what motivates her. Teresa and I love the moments of 
learning, right? Amy loves being able to support the, mm-hmm. the the team and doing the work and and making sure that we're slowing down enough to pay attention to that and tap into it. That's 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 what I think it it should look like, right? It's not going to be this blanket statement. And of, maybe that's that's the main that's the most important job of a leader. Yeah, is to figure out yeah. what is it that lights the light in people's eyes. What is yeah. it that they're passionate about? What is it that would get them excited about going to work? And if because if you can't find that, all you have is that sad, you work for me and you come here and you punch the... And we've all experienced people in, in random times that, that made a difference in yeah. jobs that you would never think... Like I'm always thinking, I, I don't like flying that much. I fly a lot uh, for, you know, conferences and professions and so on, but it's not my thing. I don't really, I, I don't think I'll ever really, really like it. Um, so I remember recently I was at an airport and there was this guy in the, whatever the name of the store is, Paradise Store, you know, they have a zillion of those in airports. And that guy was so great. Yeah. And he made such a difference in my life that day because I was nervous and he cheered me up. And all of a sudden (laughs) I had this rush of, ooh, this is so nice. He's a salesperson in an airport store. Somebody, some smart leader who is really influential in that he's a young person in that young man's life would tap into you're making a difference in the traveler's lives. Yeah. And yeah. not you're making money for the president. Yeah. Or the board of trustees or whoever. <laughs> like yeah. The, yeah. Right? So I think that's the, the, uh, there's a, a lot of discussion on whether the leader sh- uh, sets the vision. And of course, that's kind of controversial mm-hmm. too, because mm-hmm. vision and the ability to have a vision are considered huge, very important leadership uh, um, competencies. But again, in times of crisis and in times of mess, nobody has that magical telescope. Nobody has the crazy vision. So um, I think it was uh, Sharon Dalas Park who wrote uh, Leadership Can Be Taught. Mm. She was at the International Leadership Association Conference. Um, or maybe, no, it was that conference that we went to together. Oh, yeah. That conference on uh, yes. Case in Point. Remember yes. at the University of Minnesota? You bet and I she do. she said it's not about vision. I hope I'm not misquoting her. It, it's about purpose. Yeah. And that really stuck with me, that idea that it's not necessarily the leader's job to establish the vision because the vision could be collective because the leader at some points may not know where they're going either. But it's that sense of common purpose that you absolutely have to establish if people are going to follow you voluntarily, regardless of whether you have the authority or not. Um, One important thing to say is that The fact that the word leadership implies involuntary followership does not mean the leader cannot have authority also. Hmm. It is possible to be a leader and have authority. But if you're truly a leader, your authority is irrelevant. Hmm. People will follow you anyway. And you hear that. You know, it's always, I love when somebody will say, I would follow that person anywhere. If they mm-hmm. leave, I'll leave. I If they wanted me to do this, I would absolutely do that. And not that that's said often, but when it is, it is said with conviction, right? Or somebody who says, oh, you, you're starting something? Yeah, I'm, I'm behind you. What do you need, right? Mm-hmm. What's the support you need? And now, of course, we... We it, it, it's dangerous to also romanticize that yeah. and ignore yeah. the pitfalls because mm. that is also a sort of that, that is also a type of power. Yeah, sure. Right. So authority sure. is a type of power, but being charismatic and being liked and having people get excited about you that's all that's another sort of power. And it's possible for somebody to use that power in nefarious ways. Sure. So 
basically, at the end of the day, whether people are following you because you have authority or whether people are following you because you're exciting to them, the there is a very similar danger there. And that is mm -hmm. you could be leading people astray. You still need to use it ethically and you still need to ask yourself, could I be wrong? And honestly, yeah. maybe this is a woman talking. Again, I can't take, I can't go away from my positionality and from how I grew up and so on. But I do think high confidence is overrated. Yeah, I do too. <sighs> I, I do, you know, I... And here's why. Well, here's one reason that I've observed. Well, I mean, I say this with love, but intellectual humility is sexy. Like, and I don't mean sexy in like a romantic, <laughs> sexy way, but it's, oh, yeah, that, that overconfidence. I mean, part of that is uh, many of us have a uh, discomfort with uncertainty. So if you feel certain, then then and I'm going to feel more certain. I and I share this often. When when somebody tells me, "Oh, I'm really self-aware." No, I'm a good leader. Like like definitively. A mm -hmm. 100% of the time they're not. <laughs> like I, I shouldn't say that. I won't say all. But like 99% of the time, the person who comes from an incredible place of of confidence in how they say it. Now, are there people I can think of some friends? However, <laughs> they act constantly in ways of of intellectual humility or mm -hmm. like, yeah, and I get it wrong too, right? But the people who are like, no, I'm good, period. Mm -hmm. But the but the the people who always show the most self awareness, the the people who I personally go, yeah, I would love to work with you, are the ones who go, I try. I don't know if I always get it right, but I try, or I know mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm aware in some, like, like the humility language shows up, right? And not, not from a self-deprecating perspective, not from a, like a, a, an extreme position of, uh, what do I want to say, like beating yourself up, but just this, like, I try, like, I don't know if I'm there. Sometimes I get distracted or whatever the case is. And, but I do, I do wonder if the desire for people who are confident and sometimes overconfident, and that can be a trap I can fall into too, to be very clear. When I get really passionate about something, you better believe I can just like, if I believe it, I will say it like I believe it. And I have to be really. I have to make sure that I'm constantly challenging myself and surrounded by people who go, yeah, yeah, but I have a different perspective on that. But I think it's because that confidence calms down that fear of uncertainty a bit. And then we go back to the whole issue of coercion, like coming yeah. back in full circle. Yeah. You not only need to be surrounded by people who will challenge you, but you need to create an environment in which those people will be safe enough to challenge you. Right. Otherwise, yeah, we, we can all fall into that trap. We, we're all, um, I don't know, I shouldn't say we're all, I'm going to speak for myself. I am very confident in some things mm -hmm. too. I'm not mm -hmm. confident in everything. There's right. a lot of stuff that I'm not confident about, but there's stuff that I'm confident about and I could be wrong. Yeah. And, and, Right and wrong are relative anyway. Like I could be right in some contexts mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. not right in some others. And I need people to yin and yang here to, to balance it out. Um, I really like, for example, the, the relationship I have with my own boss in which I feel very comfortable challenging him, but I also deeply respect him. So like I really like that that kind of relationship. Now, does he have authority over me? Yeah. Yeah. Does it matter? Not really. Yeah. I do my job with or without him. Yeah, that, that that is something that I think can be really magical. And it doesn't have to be with your boss. It can be with your colleague. It can be with your team. It can be with other people in your organization. And even though I'm saying, hey, this is academia, academia is very hierarchical. So this experience is not necessarily the experience everybody else yeah. has. Yeah. Yeah, it's very hierarchical and sometimes very ego driven, oh, depending yeah. on the the group. Well, and you know, I mean, what you're speaking to is 
I mean, it goes, it goes to that, the consistency of psychological safety, right? Mm -hmm. When we can have cultures where people can challenge and be challenged. Yeah, it's interesting to think about. I want to, I want to chew on that, the, the relationship between shared leadership and psychological safety. Because mm. when I think about relationships that I experience as feeling high levels of psychological safety, I say I because I maybe the other person doesn't feel this way or project teams I've been a part of or even clients, you know, even some clients where I have felt and have seen people demonstrate high levels of psychological safety. There, there was almost this shared leadership um, happening. I, yeah, I want to chew on that a little bit. I think because I think that's interesting. It's not something I feel. What I feel like I see organizations talk about is we, we want people to be empowered. We want them to take ownership. We want them to act like a business owner. Right? These are the kind of mm -hmm. quintessential mm -hmm. phrases. But what would it look differently to say, no, we want to create a culture of shared leadership? And uh, and what would that look like? And what might that, what kind of, um, what would emerge, right? Or when 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 have teams done that really, really well? And, and what was possible because of it? Um, and also, like, what were the traps? Yeah. In what moments that's not a good idea. Right. Like the example that we usually come up with is if the building is on fire, I'm not right. going to sit down and have a democratic discussion. Right, right. <laughs> but then if the building is on fire, then, then the, and there is a firefighter in my building, then that person knows where to go. And at that yeah. moment, in fact, that's, that's kind of a, a good example to me because in my, in my classes now, I have um, at Barry. I have quite a few firefighters. I have quite a few military people. Um, I have police officers. Right, like many of my students are in public safety uh, roles, and in the class and in right in the context of the program, I'm the leader, and yeah. I'm also the person with authority. If the building were on fire, I would stop being the leader very fast. Yeah. And perhaps the question then becomes, um, how does shared leadership or even a switch between the leader and the follower, it's not even a shared leadership, yeah, but a like moment we in talked which about the earlier, that becomes, alternating, that yeah. alternating, how does it happen in the context of authority? So the mm. leader who voluntarily um, gives up their authority to follow somebody else who at that moment would be the best person for that moment. Um, and how can you bring that to organizations? Because mm. organizations are going to have fires too. Yeah. They're going to have moments in which somebody else should be leading that conversation, that project, that system. And not just the person whose job it is to do it. Yeah. Well, Chris, I mean, you and I can talk all day. I'm just, I'm really proud that we didn't buy any domains during this time. No, I'm just kidding. No, <laughs> that's, that's an inside joke, folks. That's a joke that anytime Chris and I get together, we brainstorm and get excited about ideas. And, you know, it was a good session if we bought some web domains that we, we may or may not use shared we haven't bought domains in ages i mean what's I happening to us sarah <laughs> i we need to spend more time together no but i i think that this idea of shared leadership i i do want to bring you back on and dig deeper into ethics because for a future episode only because i think that that is a concept that is so well i don't think i know right and we mm -hmm. know that it's such an important concept and often i feel like I don't know, people think about it in terms of oh, lawyers have to go to ethics training or mm -hmm. right, certain industries have to go to ethics training instead of really thinking about that. So future future conversation, couple weeks or couple months, we'll have you back and we'll talk about ethics. But I really appreciate this dialogue around this concept of shared leadership. I'm curious to 
personally dig in more to that and and just reflecting for myself of I think you've given you've given me a name to something we're trying to evolve to even within our company because you know it's my my company I started it so there's a lot of deferring to me and my authority and that's not the kind of company I want all the time and so what is that what are those moments of either alternating leadership or shared leadership what is that what does that look like and how do you cultivate that yeah i think that's the question i'm really chewing on for myself as as the person who has a lot of authority how do i what does it look like to give that authority up Mm -hmm. right or to shift it and um yeah you're just giving me a lot of stuff to think about so thank you well, thank you. And I, I love how we have these conversations and they kind of organically grow and we have necessarily no idea of what we're talking about as we start. So this is super fun. Yeah, no, this was great. Chris, for people who want to connect with you, who are maybe interested in following you and your research. Well, okay, so here's, I'll give a plug. Chris is going to be facilitating our second webinar in October, or third webinar in October, where she'll be exploring the idea of decoding personality and understanding the big five. So if you liked our chat today and want to learn more from Chris, be sure to go to our website and you can sign up for the, uh, the webinar series so you can learn directly from Chris. But Chris, what's the best places for people to connect with you? Um, LinkedIn obviously is a possibility, or honestly, if you professors are very easy to find, right? If we wanted to hide, it would be bad. So if you just <laughs> do a search on Chris Wildermuth, Barry University, you're going to find me very quickly. Just make sure you don't add an H to my name or you're going to go to cyber nowhere. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I love you, Chris. I love you I so love much. You Thanks for being on the show today. And to the next uh, Disney. Yeah. Soon. <laughs> Soon. Our guest this week has been Dr. Chris Wildermuth, and there's a number of takeaways I'm holding on to from this conversation. I I wasn't familiar with the term and practice and research behind shared leadership, and I'm just really excited to dig in and explore what does that look like and and how we can weave that into our work, not only with clients, but our own world. So that, that was just a real gift. And we want to hear from you. We love to hear your thoughts. What resonated for you? What questions do you have? Maybe when was a time when you experienced shared leadership? And what was that like? How did it come about? You can always send me an email at podcast at sarahnollwilson.com. Or you can send me a message on social media platforms where my DMs are always open. You can find me most prevalently on LinkedIn. And if you haven't already, please be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show on your preferred podcast platform. Another way you can support the show is by becoming a patron. You can go to patreon.com slash conversations on conversations, where your financial support goes directly to supporting the team that makes this show possible. Plus, you get some pretty great swag. A big thank you to our team that makes this show possible, to our producer, Nick Wilson, our sound editor, Drew Knoll, our transcriptionist, Becky Reinert, our marketing consultant, Jessica Burge, and the rest of the Snowco crew. And just a big final thank you to my colleague and my friend and my mentor, Dr. Chris Wildermuth. This has been Conversations on Conversations. Thank you so much for listening. And remember, my friends, when we can change the conversations we have with ourselves and others, we can change the world. So be sure to rest, rehydrate, and I'll see you again next week.